Welcome to the Physical Product Movement, a podcast by Fiddle. We share stories of the world's most ambitious and exciting physical product brands to help you capitalize on the monumental change in how, why, and where consumers buy. I'm your host, Ken Ojuka. In this episode of the Physical Product Movement Podcast, I speak with Jamba Dunn, founder and CEO of Rowdy Mermaid, a premier kombucha and functional beverage brand located in Boulder, Colorado. Jamba talks about his obsession and passion for kombucha and how his scientific and research-focused approach led to the creation of a unique, light, refreshing, clean, functional beverage unlike other kombuchas on the market. He shares how his past experiences made him extremely reluctant to become an entrepreneur, but eventually the feedback he was getting from friends and family about his beverages that he was making just for fun convinced him to give entrepreneurship a try despite his strong reservations. Jamba talks about starting a kombucha tap room and selling kombucha at farmer's markets that put him directly in front of customers. This provided him with the immediate feedback loop that he needed to evolve his product. He talks about how that feedback directly influenced the direction of his products. He also talks about the importance of being selective about the words used to position and market products and how that impacts the expectations of customers. I appreciate Jamba telling us about the Rowdy Mermaid story and how to succeed in the competitive and quickly evolving market of functional beverages. There's a lot to learn in this episode. I think you'll enjoy it. All right, Jamba. Hey, thanks for jumping on with me. I appreciate you making the time. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. All right. So we've got a lot to talk about. And obviously, we want to get into your company and, and what you guys do and some of the exciting things you have on the horizon. But before we kick all of that off, why don't we um, start with a quote? Do you have one that you could share? I actually have two I would love to share. Before starting this company, I used to work with uh, a very smart person in the Silicon Valley who would listen to me complain often about the difficulties at our company at that point and about how I wanted to go off and do something else on my own. Mm -hmm. And one day he told me, don't let your fear of an unknown future keep you stuck in a dissatisfying present. And huh. I took that advice and I wrote that quote down and I have never been able to find it ascribed to anybody. And so I assume that he made that up. That's but awesome. Nice. And yeah, can, uh, you, can you say it again? Sure. Yeah. Don't let your fear of an unknown future keep you stuck in a dissatisfying present. Hmm, like that. And since starting this company, I have also come to really appreciate this Robert Frost quote, the only way around is through. <laughs> <laughs> I think for anybody who runs uh, a small business or anyone who's an entrepreneur, that's sage advice. Yeah. And it kind of reminds me of why I like entrepreneurship is that it kind of forces that growth. Like in order to build the type of company that you want to build, you've got to become the type of person that you need to become to run that company. So yeah. you need to grow. Yeah. So those are great. I, I actually think that's a great place to, to kick off. I, I want to hear about your background, what you were doing before Rowdy Mermaid and kind of the circumstances that led you to want to start this business. Sure. Yeah. So my background is varied. It was certainly not in entrepreneurism or beverage or CPG. Early on out of college, I was an Egyptologist and lived in, in Egypt for a short time doing research and came back to Berkeley where I had gone to school and ended up using my understanding of Egyptology and you know, thousands of years of politics to get a job with a local think tank in, in Berkeley, an anti-war think tank. And that was a lot of fun. And at <laughs> some point, they needed help with the website. And this is back when HTML was a brand new language. <laughs> People were just trying out HTML and 
it sounds funny now because that's obviously so rudimentary. And so I, I taught myself HTML so I can help build their websites. And then at one point I realized I could be using just this skill doing HTML in the Silicon Valley and making a lot more money. And then maybe that would help me go back to uh, Egyptology. And so I decided to go into the Silicon Valley and um, instead of actually making the money I needed to go back, I burned out and decided I, I just needed to get out of uh, the Silicon Valley and California and tech all together. And I moved to Colorado. It sounds like that was what, 1999? Is that kind of the time period? Yeah, that was exactly the time period. It was a really kind of exciting time because... People were becoming millionaires left and right. And suddenly the parking lot that was all red and blue cars and trucks and stuff turned into black BMWs, almost just a sea <laughs> black BMWs almost overnight. And people were making multi-million dollars on uh, stock and then just pulling the cord and getting out and starting new businesses. So I had a friend who worked with me and he started a winery. So it seemed like anything was possible. And then all of a sudden the crash came and that was just about overnight. And it seemed almost like, wow, okay, well, this is going to be a much longer haul than I had expected. And I was already burned out from the years I'd spent in the Valley. Actually, I took a class at, at Naropa University uh, in Boulder, Colorado, and a writing class. And, mm -hmm. and just to, to journal and just explore something else. And while I was out in Colorado, I realized this is the most spectacular life I've ever witnessed or experienced. People are climbing and hiking and biking. Everyone is active. It was glorious outside, beautiful weather. You could see the mountains. It just... Everything was, it, it felt like what I ultimately wanted for my life uh, anyway. And so, why not just move from the Silicon Valley to Boulder? And I was kind of hemming and hawing on that for the better part of a year. And that quote that I started off with don't let your fear of an unknown future keep you stuck in a dissatisfying present was the advice of a colleague. Um, mm. who would listen to me talking about wanting to get out of the valley and wanting to go to Boulder, et cetera. And right. so me and my girlfriend at the time, who later became my wife, just decided, hey, let's do this thing. And we got out, moved to Boulder, and got never a dog, back. <laughs> built a garden, did all those kinds of things. And, and suddenly just realized we're actually living for the first time. And so what is this new life? Like, what's the most exciting part of this new life? And, and for me, it was plants and gardening and understanding herbs and growing herbs and making teas and really sort of geeking out on, on the plant world. Interestingly, even though we stayed in Boulder for a long time and I ended up teaching in the local college system, mm -hmm. uh, I eventually left Boulder, we left Boulder and went to uh, Virginia, where I started building products with Rosetta Stone. And okay, yeah. uh, that was partially the result of having my daughter, because as you may know, something chemically happens when you have a child, <laughs> you feel like, okay, you know, I got to get my life in order again. Right? Yeah, I, I do know that well. So <laughs> and so yeah, you have uh, just one daughter or, or did you mention another kid? I, I have two kids. Yeah, you have two kids. Um, okay. And so when my daughter came along, I felt like what I was doing was not good enough. I mean, what am I doing? I'm hanging out. I'm doing some teaching. I'm writing. My wife is an artist. We're growing lots of herbs and making teas and exploring things and doing climbing and hiking. But this was not a foundation to bring a child into, we're, we're going to need more than this. We're going to need money. We're going to need structure. And something just changed in my head. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up getting a job with Rosetta Stone to help spearhead a program that they wanted to initiate, which was to build language learning software, to take the language learning software that they had and turn it into stories and 
news briefs and conversations to help learners understand the language that they had learned in a new way. And that ultimately led to making language uh, learning video games for kids mostly. It was great, actually. And I, I love the people there. Super, super smart people. I love being in Virginia. The whole thing was amazing. And then yeah. you made your way back to Boulder um, at, yeah, at some so point, right? At some point, Virginia wasn't as fulfilling as Boulder had been. And we had a Boulder office. So I moved back to the Boulder office and worked out of the Boulder office. And then I was back to now I had <laughs> gardening and climbing and, and biking and all those wonderful things and a daughter and, and a good job. It was somewhere in there that I started brewing uh, beer at first, stress brewing beer. Mm -hmm. because uh, things were, were getting pretty stressful at Rosetta Stone as we were opening up offices all over the world. And so I just decided to start brewing beer, and that was my side hobby. And it was in the middle of doing all of that that my daughter came in one day and asked me if I could make something for her. So I said, sure. Back in Virginia, our roommate had made a lot of kombucha, and it's something that I had talked about for a few years, wanting to make kombucha, although it, I didn't really know what it was, but it seemed simple enough. So I decided to start brewing kombucha for my daughter, and that was basically how it began. Yeah, so take us from there, all right? So you start brewing kombucha, mainly for your daughter. What led to that becoming a business? You know, had you thought about starting a, a CPG brand before? Had you considered it? Uh, I had never thought about starting a CPG brand, and and if I'm being completely honest, I was trying to do everything in my power to keep from being an entrepreneur. I come from a family of entrepreneurs, <laughs> <laughs> and I had survived entrepreneurism, you know, as a young child. I felt like I had a little PTSD from having working, living, and growing up in a family of entrepreneurs. It's not an easy road. Maybe you know something about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's really funny how some people, it, it's what drives them, you know? Oh, my dad was an entrepreneur. My grandpa was an entrepreneur. But then for some people, it's actually what repels them because yeah. they know how the, the difficulty, right? Oh, yeah. It was always hard, hard to make ends meet, just everything. I realized growing up that my friends, they didn't have the same stress in their lives when they were young, like I had, and that was because their parents worked for big businesses or mm. they, other businesses. So they would go to work and they'd come home and then they'd hang out and they'd have barbecues and they'd doodle all you know, other family things. But we never got that. We didn't have a lot of family barbecues. We didn't go to baseball games and we didn't have a lot of outings because you never knew when the business was going to be falling apart or sales were going to take a dip or something was going to go on that would cause my dad to have to work extremely long hours. And my grandfather, same way, always, always in his garage trying to figure out how to make the business go. For me, it felt like, well, if I could not do that, I'm going to not do that. And so <laughs> <laughs> part of going into the Silicon Valley was me saying, I'm going to join corporate America. And then when my daughter came along and I had that sense of urgency that I needed to do something to ensure that things were going to be fine for her, my knee jerk was to go back into corporate America work for a big corporation and try to just imagine that that's going to support me. And at some point, I was at Rosetta Stone and working here back here in Boulder, I realized how tentative it really is in corporate America, especially at that time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, seriously, I think I think a lot of people don't see that. It's, it's really easy to to think that it's. I guess it's classic. Grass is always greener. But just because you work for a big corporation doesn't mean you you don't have stress, and doesn't mean that things are very secure. Or sometimes it can, but a, a lot of times it's actually not. Yeah, especially the dot com bust. Um, I had seen a lot of people lose everything that they had worked for. 
And then later at Rosetta Stone, I had seen people get laid off literally the year before they were going to be the first employees to ever retire with the company. Just the ugliness of that just really made me realize that, man, if you want to do anything in this world, you got to make it happen yourself. But go back to that Robert Frost quote, the only way around is through. And I was in some ways trying to skirt a, a level of responsibility that I think I ultimately needed to just grab a hold of and, and go for. Right. So yeah. I was making kombucha in the garage for my daughter. And because I was really ambitious after my daughter was born, I decided to not only work uh, more than full time with Rosetta Stone, but also to obtain a, a PhD at the same time and was flying back and forth to Switzerland where I did my PhD. When I finished with that, it felt like I had this huge sort of all this time left in my life. So I was working and I had my daughter, but I needed something else that school had, uh, university had filled. And I decided unwittingly to fill that with kombucha and research about kombucha. And kombucha in my life became such a rabbit hole that it was almost an occupational hazard. People would come over to have dinner with mostly my wife because at that point I, I was so far down the rabbit hole that I nobody wanted to hang out with me. <laughs> I didn't have any friends. And, and whether it was my wife's friends or my wife's family, ultimately somebody would say, so how's kombucha? And I'd see uh, the look on everyone's face. Was like, <laughs> oh, go there. And it's like x on the kombucha. <laughs> <laughs> And I couldn't help myself. It would just all come spilling out about the difficulties and the interests and the everything. And then at some point, I'm cutting way ahead, but at some point I realized I should just be doing that. I should just be in that world of kombucha and beverage because it is so fascinating and, and so deep. I'd never understood that there could be something so complex. Um, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. in. And so you thought you should just be in that world because you were obsessing about it anyway. Like that's all you were yeah. thinking about anyway. So you might as well figure out how to do a, a business in that world. Well, even then, uh, so I don't know if I'm just dense or what, but even when I decided to spend almost you know, all of my available free time researching kombucha and figuring out how to make it and I hired a microbiologist and he and I had worked together to try to solve the issues that kombucha had because unbeknownst to me, I didn't realize that all the other kombucha companies didn't approach kombucha like a science project. Hmm. I was just a guy fresh out of my doctoral program thinking, well, that's the only way we approach any problems. We study them, we do the research, etc. So lo and behold, my approach was very, very different from many people who had maybe been given a SCOBY and been told a little bit about the process. I know some people certainly had a kind of mystical approach to kombucha, et cetera, but nobody was approaching it like a science project. So that's what I did. And so I hired scientists and we started solving some of these problems. We often say that I reinvented a 2000 year old beverage to suit the tastes of a three year old girl. <laughs> That's exactly what had occurred because my daughter wanted kombucha made from her favorite flowers and herbs. By this point, we had the gardens that I was talking about and we would make lots of teas, et cetera. And so my daughter really wanted flowers in there and lavender in there and hyssop and other things that she loved. So I said, yeah, we could do that. And I turned to the scientist that I had hired and he goes, no, you can't do that. It has to have tea in it. And I said, well, let's make that our goal then. Let's make it the world's first decaffeinated kombucha that also has extremely low sugar and no fluoride and we can control the process so that it, it doesn't go over alcohol and i set all these parameters for us and basically just went down that road and ended up creating a type of beverage that didn't exist at that time 
Huh. And maybe this is actually a good spot to tell us just a little bit about, you know, just think about the listener out there that doesn't know a lot about kombucha. What is it about kombucha and that makes it so interesting? And it's obviously really popular right now. And why is that? But then also, I think that will help to contrast your approach to the traditional kombucha that you see out there. Sure. So kombucha is a, a combination of yeast and bacteria that ferment sugars or turn sugars into alcohol and acids. Traditional beer, for instance, in wine is just uh, yeast only. So it's a little bit more controllable with just a yeast strain that is very not well known, maybe engineered, how much sugar you could put in and how much alcohol it will produce and what those flavor notes might be. Mm -hmm. Kombucha is the Wild West, though, because nobody quite knew exactly what the yeast strains or the bacterial strains were. We, we knew that there was a combination of at least several, but later genetic reports showed that there could be hundreds of types of bacterial strains and five or six different types of yeast strains. And so what happens when you make kombucha is you make a sweet tea with lots of cane sugar in it and just regular black tea. And then you put almost a starter, they call it a, a SCOBY a lot of times or a mother. And that's a combination of yeast and bacteria. You put it in there mm -hmm. and then those things start consuming the sugar and creating alcohol and acids. And then the yeast and bacteria grow and expand. Eventually, the concept is that they will finish transforming all the sugar into acid, into alcohol, and then all of the alcohol will transform into acids. And what you're left with is ultimately a very sour and very sweet beverage, and it has living probiotics in it. It's got yeast, it's got bacteria that's good on the gut, and it does a lot of great things for the body. It tonifies the body. It's been associated with a lot of different health benefits. And so what I wanted to do was to start changing the base of it. Instead of using tea, using herbs and fermenting flowers, but it doesn't produce the same type of product. Okay. Ultimately, it, it's been a sort of a non-starter for a lot of kombucha companies to always use a decaffeinated or a non-caffeinated base like flowers, for instance. So my research was into exactly what are the yeasts and bacterial strains that uh, are in kombucha, what are the ones that were growing specifically in mine because what we didn't understand at first, but later did, is that so many factors are involved in what grows in kombucha. The water, your altitude, the pressure, environmental factors such as heat, all these things will determine what's actually growing in your kombucha. And so here we are, way up in the mountains, right, in Boulder, and what we're producing is very, very different from what some of the companies at sea level were producing. Interesting. And so it took a long time of performing research and working closely with labs and then eventually building our own laboratory to understand what grows best in our environment and how can we care for that a little bit. In some ways, I, I often used to think of it like potted plants. They're plucked out of nature, they're put into pots, and yet they won't grow everywhere. I mean, potted plants in Florida are very different from the ones we grow here in Colorado, or you might grow in Utah. Mm -hmm. and so uh, in some ways, it's finding the right plant, the right environment, the right watering schedule, all of those things together to create the healthiest bacteria and yeast-based. And that was the journey that I set out on. And then later, what can we do with those known bacterial and yeast strains to work with them so that they don't create the levels of alcohol that we often see in kombucha? Right. And how can we control that better? And ultimately, or I guess primarily early on, so that your daughter could also consume it. You know. And this all simply began because when, when I would give her kombucha in the mornings, she would go crazy. I mean, she, <laughs> she 
she'd jump around. She was, I mean, you have kids and kids are crazy anyway. To put it lightly, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you do know when something is amiss. If your kids woke up and drank a cup of coffee before coming down every morning, you would notice that. You'd be like, yeah. things are weird, but this is weirder. Yeah, well put. Or even just sugar. Like uh, eat, yes. if they eat a lot of sugar in the afternoon, we know that the evening is going to be a little rough because oh. it definitely affects them. Okay, so this is all interesting. I want to kind of zoom out to you're making your kombucha in a different way, starting with different base. What is the, the benefit to the consumer? Like, why is that different? And what sets your product apart you know, from, from the other kombuchas out there? One of the hallmarks of kombucha, um, and, and it's interesting to me because for about five years, I haven't heard anyone talk about it. One of the hallmarks of kombucha in the early days was that it, it could leach. It will leach things. Don't put it in plastic. It will leach the plastic. Don't hmm. put metal in there. It will leach the metal. And that was a constant, constant refrain back 12, 13 years ago. You be very careful of what you put in there because it will leach anything out. Don't leave the paddle you're stirring with in there, that kind of a thing. And so at some point during my early research, we realized that not a lot of those probiotic strains actually survive the passage through the digestive tract where your acid levels in your stomach could go down to 2 pH. We realized that maybe kombucha in its natural form could have some benefit to the gut, but what would really need to occur would be that the, the probiotics themselves would go through the passage through your organs, in your intestines, they would maybe a couple of them would find purchase in there and maybe colonize, and then that could be ultimately really good for digestion. But it seemed a little sketchy at the time. And all of the research that we had been doing and that we had been reading told us that that could potentially not be the case. So at this point, I had been doing a lot of gardening with medicinal herbs, and I was kind of a little obsessed with medicinal herbs. And I was trying to understand specifically how we could get the, the most benefit out of the herbs possible, whether it's making a tincture or making a tea or a long steep or a cold steep or whatever it is uh, that you typically do with herbs. And at one point, uh, a woman who had come over to help me with some of the things I was working on, Danielle, she was an herbalist, and she and I were talking about the fact that, hey, is it possible to use the leaching properties of kombucha to actually leach some of the benefits out of the herbs that we want? What we started doing is lots and lots and lots of research and tests with the herbs and sending things off to laboratories and, and seeing if, in fact, if we put certain types of herbs in there that have benefits to the body that you could read about on the internet all day long. Can we extract those better using kombucha rather than using your traditional tea making process or whatever the process may be? And that was the big difference for us. What we began doing was building recipes for different functions based on the herbs uh, and the plants that we were utilizing, the botanicals, and not necessarily relying um, on the uh, probiotics solely. And so therefore, instead of making a kombucha base and just flavoring it in many different ways, we decided to make every single product, every skew, we call it every flavor, mm -hmm. uh, its own benefit. And so we, we worked really diligently to build those benefits from the herbs and the process from the ground up. And in that way, we made for lack of a better word, the first uh, plant-based kombucha and the first functional kombucha. Yeah, yeah. Very, very different from the set. Got it. And, and, and I see on, on your website, you could name it something like a, the immunity, you know, tonic, or you can talk about how it, it has a calming effect because you use lavender in it and, and all of that. Is that what you're talking about when you say that you made it into sort of a functional beverage? Yes, except for the immunity tonic uh, is our brand new adaptonic lineup. But yes, exactly. We took the benefits from the herbs, we extracted those benefits, and then we made a kombucha based on those benefits. 
clarity exactly. and calming and refreshing, you know, that, those types of benefits. Interesting. Yeah. I'm sure that that's what sets you guys apart. Like uh, nobody was doing that, especially at that time. Is that correct? Yeah, nobody was doing it. And interestingly, I didn't know fully how to tell the consumers that that's what we were doing. And in fact, I think it's, it's still something that's not totally unknown about Rowdy Mermaid products. A lot of people think that we just flavor them like all other kombuchas, and that's not necessarily the case. It wasn't until just, I think, a year or two ago that we started seeing other brands branch out into making functional kombucha, which is kind of ironic because kombucha itself is known as a functional beverage. Right. Functional beverages are beverages you drink to give you some kind of function, whether that's coffee because you need the, the uplift or tea because you need the relaxing benefits or digestion, throat coat, they all have a function. So kombucha's function was digestion. So every kombucha brand was just going after digestion. And most of those companies with their new products are still just targeting digestion. And we always figured digestion was just sort of a baseline. But from there, we could elevate the category by approaching all these other functions. That's interesting. And, and you were kind enough to send us some samples and, and they're absolutely great. You sent them here to the office and they were gone the same day. So I think everybody enjoyed them. And one thing I noticed about it though, is that it's a different kombucha. It's a little lighter than a lot of it. It's not very vinegary or very fermented tasting. You know, it's kombucha, but it's not overwhelming like a lot of the, the other kombuchas that are out there. And was that a, um, a result of the process, of the way that you guys uh, created it, or was that intentional? How did you come to that? Yeah, absolutely. In trying to understand what the right yeasts and bacteria were to work with a, a decaffeinated kombucha, so now we have caffeinated and decaffeinated skews. But in trying to make those first beverages out of flowers for my daughter, and trying to limit, as I said, fluoride and and different things that we didn't want in there. We hit on a recipe, I guess we'll call it, that really produces kombucha that is just as acidic as anything else that's on the market, but it doesn't taste as acidic. It tastes almost like water in some ways. And that's because the acids that we're balancing are not predominantly acetic acid, which is the acid from vinegar, but the combination of several different types of acids that research tells us is actually better for the body and digestion. Interesting. Jamba, in, in talking to you about this, obviously anybody listening could, could feel and understand and sense the, the passion that you have for this category and specifically around kombucha. Like you, you, you were saying earlier, you just launched into talking people's ears off about kombucha. I just wonder about the listener out there that maybe they have a similar passion or maybe we call it an obsession with something that could be productized. And I'm kind of wondering what your next steps were. Like, let's talk maybe just a little bit about turning this passion, this obsession into an actual business. What were your first steps? And then what would you recommend to the listener that's, you know, maybe looking to fall in your footsteps a little bit? Interesting. The, the business was an interesting, almost natural outgrowth of that passion. E- even though I had invested a lot of time and my own resources, and I had hired a, a food scientist and a microbiologist and We had worked together. I had rented a space here in Boulder, a a tiny warehouse where we could just produce things and and work on them in the background. I still wasn't thinking that I'm building a business here. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was just thinking, I need to get down to the the root of this whole thing. Like I need to go as far down this rabbit hole and then just like exhaust it and burn it out and get through this and go back to my life kind of an approach because it was such a big fascination. But then what started happening was that people that would heard about me making kombucha and friends and family, et cetera, would say, well, let me try it. And so I started giving it out to people because one of the big issues I had was not enough storage and still an (laughs) issue today. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the quicker I could give it away, the better. And so sometimes I would run to my neighbors and say, hey, I've got a new batch of kombucha. It should be done today. 
um, do you want some? And people would just start coming down to my house and bring all kinds of things. I, I can't imagine doing it today, but I definitely had people bring, dump out the rest of their milk and wash out the big plastic milk jug uh, yeah. and bring that down. You talk about leaching and that's definitely, definitely something I wouldn't do today, but there were those types of situations. People were bringing me ball jars and people were leaving ball jars at my house and saying, Hey, whenever you've got some kombucha, I love the last batch. Here's some jars, just fill them up and give me a call. And people started showing up on such a regular basis. And then the conversation shifted from, hey, that's pretty good to, holy crap, I started to take a drink and then I literally couldn't stop drinking it. And I just downed the entire thing all at once. And that was an experience that I had had several times. Yeah. And and I was trying to get to the, the kernel of that. And then I had people offering me money for it. And I realized like, wow, okay. So not only is this something that I enjoy and something that I'm freakishly obsessed with, but maybe it makes sense because at that point, Rosetta Stone was having a lot of management challenges. Uh, maybe it makes sense that I just consider this as a business. And what could that look like? Well, it could look like... Uh, maybe creating the world's first kombucha tap room in Boulder of all huh. places. People are going to love this. And so I developed that concept and began building that out in 2000, late 2012, 2013. And I didn't get it finally set up and authorized by the city of Boulder until April of 2014. And by that point, uh, a couple of others had gotten started and up and running before I could get mine going, but there were just a couple of us at the beginning to be the first people in the world to put kombucha on tap. So that was the, the business model. We'll, we'll have a tasting room. We'll get drunk drivers off the street by offering uh, a non-alcoholic uh, tasting room. Uh -huh. and, uh, and then we'll turn uh, this sort of functional specialty beverage into a, a lifestyle beverage where people can sit around and have delicious beverages, have conversations, we'll do readings, we'll have music, it'll be like a, a regular tasting room for a brewery, but it will be all non-alcoholic. And, and that, at that, that point, you, you, you didn't started. have the can or you hadn't canned it or weren't actually selling it in stores or anything like that? We weren't selling it in stores. There was no thought to want to sell it in stores. The entire process was going to be just kegged, sold on tap from our farmer's market cart, which I eventually got going. And that was the business model at first. <laughs> I, I kind of see the advantages of that in that one, one of the things that the early product companies can really benefit from is, is actually getting in front of their customers. And when they take that first sip, you're face to face with them and you can see the reaction. You can, you know, get direct feedback, all of that. So I can actually see a benefit to going that route. One of the interesting things looking back, and I, I mean, some ways I, I understood it at the time, but not as clearly as I do now. Uh, writing products for Rosetta Stone was interesting um, because there were so many editors at Rosetta Stone, so many professionals and so many people who were so good at what they did. And they would look over everything that I wrote and the people on my team wrote. It was this very organic kind of an editing process that would go back and forth until we all got to something that we loved together before it would be released to the public. And in a lot of ways, the process of developing products that we would resell at the tasting room and at the farmer's market and was a little bit like that because our consumers would say, I like it if it was just a little sweeter or I'd love this if it tasted a little bit more like this. And we would take all of that information and write it all down and compare our notes at the end of the market and say, let's make the tweak. And so uh, mm -hmm. the next time we went out, we would get more information and it was a really extremely helpful process. So there was an education going two ways. One, only 5% of the American public knew what kombucha was at the time. So we had people constantly who would ask us, what is this? And we would have to tell them and educate the public because the product was never going to grow as a category unless people became educated about it. So we were an interface for that. 
And then they would tell us what they liked or didn't like or what their experience of it was. And they would educate us and we would go back and change the product. And I would say, back to your point, if you're thinking about making a business, don't ever just create a product that you think is good enough and raise all the money or whatever you need to do to put it out into the public until you've done that kind of research. Right. And that's something that you mentioned, but I just wanted to explicitly say it, which is the real-time fast iteration, which is, I think, one of the advantages of things like farmer's markets, where you can get that direct feedback, go back to the lab or the kitchen or whatever, make the tweak, show up the next day or you know the next week with the tweaks in place. The faster you can iterate there, the, the, the faster and, and quicker um, and more efficiently you can get to an actually great product that fits the market you're going after. Absolutely. I think the other big piece of it was <clears throat> on reflection was that we also realized that sometimes a product was really, really good and good enough, or maybe even excellent in our, our eyes, but consumers were half and half. Some of them loved it, some of them didn't so much, et cetera. And we started realizing very early on that the way we talked about the product or presented the product would change the expectations. Hmm. And so we did a lot of tests with our public by having, say, sometimes two scripts about how we would present a flavor. And we realized very quickly that one way of talking about it got more consumers on board with the product than another way. Hmm. Uh, that also helped when we were later um, developing the packaging and the concepts for how we would present these as standalone, which is a very, very different world, how we could best convey the, the benefits and the flavor and the expectations to consumers. And so marketing began to become an extremely important part of the process. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So not only iterating on the actual product, but the fullness of the product, which includes the packaging, the positioning, how you describe this to a customer and, and having multiple scripts so that you can kind of A-B test and see what's working, what's accomplishing the goal. Exactly. It was very fascinating to us, to me, because I thought I had all the understanding, but what I didn't expect specifically when we had the tasting room in the farmer's market was that unless you told people what to expect, uh, a lot of times their first uh, perception was negative. And that was very fascinating for us. So we would often have to to preload people with what the expectation is of the, the flavor and the uh, of this beverage, for instance, and then setting up their expectations led them down the right path. Uh, and awesome. Yeah. No, that's true. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs maybe underestimate how important that is. It's not just about the product, but the entire presentation, everything around the product matters to the end consumer. Let's switch gears just a little bit. I know that we're almost up on time. I just wanted to hear about the new line that you guys just launched. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Also tell us where can you find your product? What retail stores are you guys in? That kind of stuff. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for asking. So the process of trying to understand how to extract just the benefits from the herbs and botanicals in roots that we've been working with for years it led to another concept that I had had, which was really to dive further into functional mushrooms. We had always worked with mushrooms. In fact, our very first kombucha that we eventually launched in the bottle, which was called Living Ginger, had a shaga mushroom in it. And that came out of a lot of research and a lot of peer-reviewed research that we had read about the utility of uh, shaga mushroom on the body. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, in early 2020, in January, we were looking at how to understand immunity. Uh, so we were a little ahead of our time, <laughs> how, to, <laughs> how to understand immunity and how can we further benefit the body by extracting just what the functional ingredients are from traditional functional mushrooms like reishi that were well known for immunity for thousands of years, but to try to understand what it is that we're, we're looking for there, like what's the ingredient in the mushroom? Because we didn't know. We were just sort of grinding them up and throwing them in. Like we see a lot of brands do that even today. 
And so what we had done is by this point, we had a laboratory, a genetics laboratory. We had a full staff of people working here. We had a PhD who was heading up the lab, who was very, very smart. And he basically started doing the research on uh, reishi mushrooms and understood that it was beta-glucans that are actually what's causing the body to have an immune response, a T-cell response. And we ended up working with another company to extract just the, the beta-glucans from those mushrooms. And the research told us if we put them back into a, a beverage at the rate of uh, 200 milligrams, that the body will prepare itself and have an immune response to prepare itself for any sort of incoming disease. Hmm. And so we started building this beverage in early 2020. <laughs> then a thing happened in 2020. I don't know if you recall. Yeah, I but... wonder what that is, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It took us until 2021 because of that thing that happened, disrupted supply chains and everything. But we ended up building a beverage called Adaptonic because the beta-glucans from mushrooms are adaptogens. And they help the body to not only deal with stress, but like I said, in particular, in this one instance, they actually activate helper T cells in the body. And we created an entire lineup of beverages that have all of this powerful mushroom medicine in there, but none of the taste. So they just taste like beautiful, naturally flavored sparkling waters. And we launched those in 2020. And now we've got uh, the addition to that lineup that should come out later this year. That's also called Adaptonic, but this is Clarity Tonic, where we have extracted just the beta-glucans from uh, functional lion's mane mushrooms that help with mental clarity. And this is the rabbit hole we're down right now. <laughs> and, uh, well, sounds great, and it sounds very appropriate for the time. I don't know if you guys planned that. It doesn't sound like you did, but yes, um, it's a very popular and needed thing right now. Yeah, we didn't know, but I think you, I, everyone's a little fatigued from uh, the last couple of years, and so the the Clarity Tonic is going to help a little bit with that. You asked where they're sold. So the Adoptonics are in five regions of Whole Foods. Our beverages, our kombuchas are in all Whole Foods markets, all Sprouts markets, and they're available at retailers all across the United States and Hawaii. HEB just started carrying the uh, Adaptonic lineup. We've got Wegmans that carries uh, both combination of both lines and Sprout. I mentioned Sprouts, Natural Grocers. So we, we're available all over. Okay, awesome. All right. Well, let's jump into the quick fire round. I've just got four questions uh, for you and just let me know the first thing that comes to mind. What is, what is one tool or resource that has helped you the most in, in your current position? There's one tool or resource. There are so many of them. I would say other founders. Uh, I would say creating a, a tight-knit community of other founders and people that I can call on on a regular basis. I'm sure today after this call, I'm going to reach out to a couple of people and just to to talk through the the challenges of business. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that was definitely a huge one for me. Another was state funding that help entrepreneurs. Uh, I didn't know that there, there was funding available until I met somebody who worked for the local government and we were able to raise some capital for the business in the early days and it was just enough to get us off our feet. Awesome. What, what's one book uh, that you could recommend to the audience? Oh, boy, so many good books. Of course, my background is in fiction, so it's hard to say, but there's a series of books. There's one book in particular called Traction that we've been talking a lot about lately, which is a, an entire process for how teams and a business communicates. And I would say that that's one book for sure that I would recommend. Awesome. Yeah, I've read that one, did the audio audible on it. I'm trying to figure out who the the author is so that we yeah. can I would have to actually like Gino, Gino Wickman. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, that's right. Yep. Yeah. Traction, get a grip on your business. What is one piece of advice that you would give your 21 year old self? My 21 year old self. Wow. You're going <laughs> way back. <now. laughs> 
this was long before all of this. I would say resilient, just have resilience. Just to understand that what you're going through right now is it's only temporary and you'll get through the other side and not to give up hope on uh, your, your dreams because things change. Okay, got it. And who is one person that could be in your field of work, maybe another entrepreneur or a brand that you look up to that you would love to take to lunch? Huh. Well, there are so many people in this category that I do take to lunch and I do love all of those people. So it's been a minute since I've seen my good friend, Justin Gold, who started Justin's Nut Butter. So I'd say I'd love to take Justin out to to lunch. So Justin, if you're out there, (laughs) (laughs) salads are on me. (laughs) That's cool. All right. We've come to the end of our time. Are there any, you know, sort of parting words that you, you would share you know, with uh, other entrepreneurs that are in the grind that are trying to get something off the ground, what would you say to them? I would say, don't let your fear of an unknown future keep you stuck in a dissatisfying present. (laughs) (laughs) We've come Uh, full circle. (laughs) We've come full circle. Yeah, things, things, things will change and you can make changes and don't be afraid of those changes. And also just the one thing I hear over and over and over again from young entrepreneurs is, They just feel so alone as though what they're experiencing and the difficulties of business are just theirs. And I am here to say that every business is dealing with the same challenges. And I don't know if that makes you feel better or worse, but (laughs) you're you're in no way alone. And, And every entrepreneur who teams up with another entrepreneur for a conversation understands like the moment you start talking with somebody else in the trenches, you, you realize you're all in this together. So reach out for help and don't ever feel like you're stuck. Um, reach out to me. Yeah. Okay. I guess on that note, if somebody wanted to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to do that? They can write to uh, info at rowdymermaid.com. And as long as you're not trying to sell me come some kind of a service, I'll write back. <laughs> awesome. Well, Jamba, uh, you've been great guests and, and uh, you know, it's fascinating to hear about your sort of the R&D and the product development part of your business. And then I just love how encouraging you are to other entrepreneurs and even offering to help others that are in, in the space and going through some of the same things. So we really appreciate it. Thanks for coming on. Uh, you've been awesome. Yeah, thank you. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, let's do this again. Okay, sounds good. Thanks. The Physical Product Movement Podcast is brought to you by Fiddle. To find out more about Fiddle and how our industry-leading inventory ops platform is giving modern brands and manufacturers full visibility into their inventory and operations, visit fiddle.io. And then make sure to search for Physical Product Movement in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Make sure to click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Fiddle, thanks for listening.